but then I was like, now I'm wondering about strange people's pants, and it was a segue and a slippery slope. So that is the opening of the video right there. <laughs> so so, yeah, sick. <laughs> kicking off this video, I am very happy to say that today on the channel we have a special guest, Kira Ford, who is doing some incredible stuff. And you're in the booktube community as a fantasy fan. Uh, I'm massively jealous of a lot of things you've been involved with and accomplished here. It's so cool to see not only you going out and like getting being involved in these fantasy adaptations, but getting them up on YouTube, somehow not having them immediately demonetized and <laughs> taken down. Wow. Uh, so thank you for doing what you're doing and thank you for being on the channel here. Thank you for having me. When you messaged me, I was like, is that the Daniel Green? And then I was fangirling for like five minutes, but then I was like, yeah, no, I can do that. Cool, whatever. <laughs> still screaming. So, I, I have to ask the question, are you comfortable being called a YouTuber yet? Or is that still like give you the knee jerk? I, I, I don't know what I was going through that week where I was like, who the fuck thinks they can call me a YouTuber? Um, no, I don't <laughs> really care. <laughs> I don't okay. really care at all. But then I've had some people go like, in their videos being like, oh, don't call Piero a YouTuber. And then I was like, ooh, that, that's not what I meant. But then I had to, yeah. I don't really mind. Like, I just call me whatever, man. I'm, I'm cool. Sometimes I get daddy. Sometimes I get she bitch. But we're all good. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. depends on the mood. <laughs> so, okay. So I, what I really, like, caught my eye with your channel and what you're doing here is I love BookTube. I love the typical videos people do, how they get introduced. But the BookTubers have become, like, fans over the ones who go above and beyond to do something different, especially for the genre that I love here, fantasy. And that's clear. I would say you're, like, the flagship flagship BookTuber in terms of, okay, now you've been in a Never Night adaptation, and you put it on your channel, and it's killing it. So yeah. I, I love <laughs> How that got started, like, how did you get into fantasy and how did it escalate to here to where you have, like, you know, never night on channel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm still asking myself. Um, I think, it, like, I was I was a really lonely kid. <laughs> I was an only child and I didn't have any friends um, and a wild imagination. So, yeah, I mean, I assume much like most fantasy lovers starts, I was a weird kid who liked <laughs> weird shit nobody else did. So, yeah, I just kind of found myself or the world's the worlds and the stories that I liked in fantasy novels and that just kind of grew as I aged and you know I went through that weird stage when I started booktube of trying to read like YA contemporary and all those sorts of popular ones and just found that that wasn't that wasn't for me which uh, I don't know like I, I I'm bored by real life which is a super <laughs> pseudo depressive thing to say but it's very I, true I, though <laughs> yeah I found in yeah in books I just I feel much more at home living the lives that I should have been living if we're gonna get all like meta and everything um yeah that, that's pretty much it and so yeah I mean that just kind of spiraled into you know being surrounded by a million and one books of just all of the the things I would rather be doing than you know sitting at my desk being a vet tech or you know all those I mean that's great too but <laughs> yeah <laughs> not, not to like just dis vet techs an entire Sorry. industry now under just, the bus just, just, well, yeah. we study really hard and we do good work <laughs> <laughs> but you yeah. are also an actress, which I find to be really impressive. And you've now combined those passions on your channel, which, how did that, I, I got it, where did that journey start? Like, how did you get the rights? Did, did you get the rights? Is this like black market I we're talking about right now? <laughs> no. Um, so it started with Maximum Ride. And it triggers me to even speak about Maximum Ride now. And everyone who's been there from the start will know. Um, so when I was younger, Maximum Ride by James Patterson, which is... Woo! These ones were my, this is the oldest book I own um, my entire life. Max was a character that I found myself in, you know, like she was a bit of a tomboy, she was a bit weird. Um, and back when I was like 13 and 14, all the girls were like kissing boys and like doing makeup. And I was like, I want to punch things in the face. Um, so <laughs> it's really angry as a kid. Um, okay. So anyway, I graduated high school. I, yeah, I, I went to acting school um, and I guess film school, uh, left with a major in theater and filmmaking. So I had a bit of an understanding of like behind the scenes stuff. Um, and this was around the time that Maximum Ride was being picked up or was announced to be picked up by I think Universal for a feature film. Um, and I really wanted to audition for it and being like a nobody from but fuck nowhere, I was kind of like, maybe if I just put it up on YouTube, maybe someone will see it and be like, oh my God, you're amazing. And obviously that didn't happen. But um, so that kind of started my love of book to film adaptations, like being able to 
to love something so much to want to enhance it. And it's there's a really fine line, I think, with book to film adaptations. Like, my be all and end all is Catching Fire. Like, I think that was one of the best books and the best film adaptations that I've ever seen um, in terms of it portrayed, how they portrayed it really truthfully whilst also having to take some liberties. Um, and it just, for me, that experience, like the movies being good enhanced the books for me, which I don't know if that, that happens. But I mean, I guess even with like The Witcher at the moment, same sort of thing. Like I'd read the first two books and I played the game and like that was cool and immersive, but it wasn't until watching the show that I was like, oh, now I want to go read the rest of the books and play the game again. And I think that's a really powerful tool to have. Um, that's yeah, why like, we're seeing this game sales go up 500 some percent yeah. since the show came out. Yeah. Yeah, just because like it's a different medium, but if you do it well, then you, it's just like a win-win for everyone involved. Um, so yeah, I'm rambling, but it started with Maximum Ride. <laughs> And then, I've seen the video that I outgrew Maximum Riot or yeah. something along. The <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd still like he's putting out a new book later this year for some stupid fucking reason, and I'm still gonna buy it, and I'm still gonna read it, and I'm still gonna make a video about it. But I'm gonna be sad that it, like that's it's one of those you know like your first ever like your first ever love that no matter yeah. how bad it gets you will still like drag yourself through the mud for it. That's yeah, that's how I feel about Maximum Ride. I have a Tie Fighter tattooed on my leg, and I'm just in this ride to the very end. <laughs> Yeah, so you told me, it's totally a thing. Yeah. Um, but I guess that segueing onto Nevernight was, you know, we did Maximum Ride. That was, you know, a zero dollar budget with like three people involved. Um, and then we did a scene from Throne of Glass, just because I loved it and I was blonde at the time and I thought, why not? <laughs> um, we did one from A Darker Shade of Magic by V.E. Schwab. And then, yeah, and then Nevernight happened. So I think that was, it started with, yeah, like, honestly, through BookTube, through me being like, oh, my God, I love making book-to-film adaptations. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd love to make Nevernight a film adaptation. Like, how crazy would that be? How wow. And then um, a, a contact from Screen Australia, which is our government funding body um, for the arts, contacted me, and they were like, hey, were you serious about that Nevernight thing? And I was like, oh, yeah, but <laughs> that's never going to happen. Like, I need a lot of money. <laughs> I'm super underqualified. And then she was like, oh, well, you know, here's, a, here's um, like a, a grant you can apply for to to um yeah to get some money for it and I was like oh yeah like nah nah it's cool don't worry about it and I I was really reluctant to do it because I I am the biggest like me and book to film adaptations we don't get along very well because I'm so pedantic even though as a filmmaker I should know like there are liberties but also I'm like it's not to the book so I hate it um because I'm a child (laughs) it was like we can we can get this going and then yeah we applied we got it um and it was all downhill from there (laughs) it wasn't it was fine uh yeah and that's kind of how it came about okay so (laughs) a couple notes on what you said one i came across your darker shade of magic video while i was reading the books i believe and so because of that i picture the protagonist as you so congratulations you've won there that's all i like that that is that and fan art are literally my entire like life goal (laughs) that's all i cared about i care if i die unsuccessful as long as i'm fan art and someone's canon lead character (laughs) how bad is that for my ego good god (laughs) (laughs) so i have to say though your your never night adaptation that's on your channel is in my opinion the most impressive fan-made thing on youtube that's been put to youtube i've seen very few things come close to capturing atmosphere character and having a production value that hit like that does i mean there's the stigma around YouTube adaptations where people kind of groan. And then I saw the trailer for years and I was like, oh, snap. Uh, yeah. This is going to push against that. Uh, so now that you've, you know, I think how many episodes are there total right now? There's three. Three episodes total. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And is, yeah. And can, I, can I ask for like breaking news here? Is that what the plans currently right now? I for the-, <laughs> the, scoop, the scoop is um, where the scoop is at. So we have the rights to make another seven episodes um, to the ones that I was originally going to create, which is when the um, the first announcement came out, said there was going to be ten, um, and then there wasn't. But So they're, they're, the scripts are pretty much ready to go. We just need the money, essentially. Um, so we're kind of talking to a bunch of funding bodies and um, investors and stuff about that. Um, so there's kind of two – the two routes we're taking are either finish the, or finish the short form series and then we can either package that as a whole and sell that to distributor, distributors – or um, I'm working on a pilot episode as well, which is like a eight to ten by one hour, um, like sh- like a, a show essentially. Mm. 
but that's a lot harder to get up and going. So we're just kind of playing it by ear what's going to be. I mean, unfortunately, profitable is a big deal with it. Like um, being on YouTube was, I kind of guess, it's. I don't think they expected it to, to do as well as it did. Because um, the, the grant was originally for like narrative short form and the other narrative short forms were either, you know, um, like a, a parody of being a YouTuber or uh, a a mental health talk about YouTube. So it's more like documentary sort of stuff, or I guess you're, it, it wasn't a high fantasy adaptation is what I'm getting at. Um, and so it's not, it, being on YouTube, it's not really expected to make money. And therefore, if you don't make money, you're less likely to be continued. You know how like, you know, yeah. seeds get canceled sort of thing. So a lot of it came down to, or comes down to the money sort of side of it. Um, yeah. And in Australia, like high fantasy isn't, we don't really have it. It's not really a thing. If it is done, it's not done well. So people don't want more of it. So the money comes, I guess the money side of it is like your American side or like your um, your, like China and stuff like that. But for this, for what it is, I think like it did well, it did really well. But it's just now kind of convincing people that we can do more with it and like, ooh, look how good the witch is going. Like, there's obviously people who want high fantasy. Let's give them high fantasy sort of thing. So, yeah, that's kind of where it's at now. <laughs> so I can I can definitely back up the idea that I promise you there's a lot of fantasy fans in Australia. It sounds like if there's not something happening but, right yeah. now, it's just an untapped market. Yeah, no, I'm fully, yeah. That, I mean, that was kind of one of my, part of my pitch was just being like, you know, there's not, like there, there's heaps of us. There are heaps of these weirdos hiding in like <laughs> secret corners of the internet surrounded by their books being like, I want high fantasy, like I want high fantasy, it's so good. And then when we get it, it's not good or like the, the effects are really bad or the this, this story, like, it just, it drops the ball in a bunch of different places. Um, and so a lot of my pitch was being, like, you know, we want to be the, the front runners for that. We want to really put Australia on the map for stuff like that. And, you know, people with money like to hear that sort of shit. So at this point, it's me trying to get my social skills up to grace so I can be like, oh, give me money and don't feel bad. <laughs> I'm in trash out. I don't know how to get money off of people. So I've got people who can do that for me. So, yeah, that's kind of the vibe. Okay. Well, and that, that's a good transition into the next kind of questions I had here, which is the culture around adaptation, something it seems like you're fairly passionate about. As someone who can officially put on their resume, you have been involved with a successful adaptation. I mean, that it's one that the fans seem happy with. I mean, I haven't seen anyone not dig what you did for Nevernight. So good job. You yes. made the hurdle, which a lot of people even in Hollywood fail to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, it's, a, it still blows my mind because obviously when you make it, you're, you're super nervous and people are going to hate it. Mm -hmm. And being like a book, everyone has different ideas of what people look like, what things sound like, what, you know, the sets are and all that sort of stuff. And so luckily I was able to work with Jay a little bit and kind of, you know, send him a text at like three o'clock in the morning being like, holy fuck, what does this look like? And he's like, oh, I, th <laughs> I thought it looked like this. And I was like, okay, great, thank you. Um, well, can you explain this to me more? So having the author on board was a, is an incredible experience. And then, yeah, I guess, I mean, I hope that what kind of translated was people realized or people understood how much I love these books and how I wasn't going to let anything kind of fall to the wayside. Um, and I still feel like I did for some things and that was out of my control, but it's just kind of what I can do better for the next time. Um, so I think that helped. I don't think anyone was kind of like, oh, she's just doing it for like money or it's not, <laughs> or just like <laughs> for, for the hubris of it all. But it was definitely more, you know, like I saw how much Mia as a character meant to people and I really wanted to bring that to a different form. Um, and it might have been one of those books that never got the chance to be a film, but at least now we kind of have a little bit, and I, I know a lot of people are like, oh, I saw the trailer, or I saw the film, and now I want to read the book, and so that kind of goes hand in hand. Oh, yeah, the, like, the best marketing for a book is to have an adaptation. The best yeah. you know, marketing for adaptation is people who are fans of the book. Um, so, But the inevitable question comes up when you're doing all this translating is you know, from book to show did you have to reconcile a lot of the things that you pictured that ended up being different like you as a fan were anything that kind of frustrated you like how did that kind of transformative process of like here's what I think of things here's the reality <laughs> yeah. um I mean I think I got really lucky being the, I guess the, the creative control over the whole thing most of it was what I pictured I mean obviously with limitations of you know locations in Australia and you know stuff like that like um for example, Jordy, who plays Trick, exactly what I imagined. Damien Garvey, who plays Scott Danio, was exactly who I pictured when I read the book, um, you know, like three or four years ago. And so knowing Damien Garvey and being in the same industry, being like, hey, man, like, you're I really like you're really inspiring. I, I read this book and you remind me of this guy. Do you want it? And he's just like, yeah, that sounds sick. So <laughs> I was really happy with um, locations. Our location manager just knocked it out of the park. 
Like for a lot of the stuff, I was like, where are we going to find, you know, the wastes? Where are we going to find the red church? Where are we going to find, you know, the old imperial? And they, my team just really went to town and was like, fuck you, I'll find it. And they did. And then our production design team just, again, just blew my mind with how, like one of the, the best ones that you guys didn't even get to see, and it kills me, was the, um, at the, f- the first episode, The Marketplace. Walking into that marketplace was like walking into a fantasy marketplace. And for like two seconds, like an hour ago, it was just like barren land. And then all of a sudden there's all this life to it. And I'm so sad we only got one shot in it. But yeah, so it's just there There were a lot of, yeah, a lot of things that we had to give because they just like didn't exist. Um, like the sand kraken. Like there's just no way I was going to be able to do that. As much as I wanted to do it, I wasn't going to get a sand kraken. Um, but I think overall, I think we pretty much... The only real, I guess, complaints from people we got were like, the, you know, I look too old or my nose isn't crooked enough or, yeah, little things like that. And, I mean, it's subjective. So How, do you, how <laughs> dare you not break your nose for this role? <laughs> I think it's the Italian nose. I don't know what people want. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. And it's the same with, you know, any sort of book-to-film adaptation is everyone's going to have a different idea of what people look like or what the world looks like. And as long as you don't kind of go completely opposite without a good reason – then people are going to, you can kind of win around, hopefully win around people with performance. So I, I, I also need to just, however you guys did your costuming, hats off to it. Because the costuming <laughs> across the board was phenomenal. Uh, uh, I really like, as a total stage nerd, I'd love it. <laughs> I'm really glad. No, our, um, our, our costume designer, Pat's my best friend. He, he's big, big in like the cosplay community. Um, and like, I, he's a big like comic nerd and all of that sort of stuff. So he, it was kind of like his wet dream for me to be like, hey, I've got this fantasy film. Do you want to? And he was just like, yes. And then like <laughs> every day he just sends me new things, new sketches, new stuff for like the upcoming seasons, just being like, how about this? So he, yeah, he did absolutely incredibly. So it seems like from your experience and, and the, like there's the people who are like, no, we should have like big corporate people who adapt the books and make the decisions. And there's the people who are like, no, 100 percent fan based. It seems like yeah. your experience, the fans running things turns out pretty damn well. I like to think so, and I mean, I mean, it varies. Like, there will always be, like, I'm sure there are, you know, fans of The Witcher who are involved with The Witcher. Like, it's not yeah. just people and do something that big for that long without loving it, because <laughs> it's stressful. Um, but then you can also see the films that very much were a money grab, and I'm going to go ahead and say Maximum Ride again, because it, it really triggers us. <laughs> Percy <laughs> Jackson adaptation. Percy Jackson, all of that yeah. sort of stuff. Like, the, it had so much potential and I, at the end of the day, could have made so much money, which at the, if you're thinking from a business perspective, that's what you want. And for them to just kind of, I guess, feel like it's shortcuts. And I know there's limitations on budget. And so there's limitations on things like special effects and um, who you can get and how long you can shoot for. And it's money, like you just hemorrhage money. Um, even, yeah, on, on our thing, it's still, it's still considered low budget. And we were just hemorrhaging money on, on everything. Um, and so, yeah, like I, I mean, I personally will always opt for a fan of the book at the helm, but I mean, not all fans have a film background or not all fans know how, how film works and stuff. But I've seen, you know, because I'm like I said, a big, big advocate of fan adaptations, I spend a lot of time looking for them on YouTube. Um, and you can definitely see the ones who, you know, who may have a zero dollar budget, but have like the heart and the core of it, which, you know, I'll, I will happily watch a, a poorly shot, shakily edited show uh, added a, 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 a oh my god adapted show if mm-hmm. i see that there's love in it or i know that there's love in it as opposed to just someone being like oh yeah we made this thing with like thirty thousand dollars and it's shit so that's, that's I, I think that's why fans <laughs> respond so positively like when you saw like henry cavill talking about witcher and how he definitely proved like i'm a fan like i'm a very big fan of these books and i think that's why a lot of people had more uh give the fact that he's not as old or he's not as rugged as you know the characters described and then we saw i saw a massive shift in the fan response to specifically the witcher when they put out a featurette with the actress playing yennefer talking about how much research she's done for the character people were pretty negative on them and then she like really came across passionate and suddenly you saw everyone being like we love this woman she cares she's one of us that's a yeah. huge thing to me is like if you're going to be involved with in these fantasy adaptations you have fan bases that are so massive I mean, I get not every actor involved is going to love the source material. You know, people get cast because they, what have yep. you. But at least you see the people are willing to put in the time and effort. And I think fans will always respond to that. Fans will always respect someone who's clearly putting in the effort to at least learn, you know, why this stuff mattered to them so much. Yeah, no, I agree. I think what was the most recent one? Like Ben Barnes is the Darkling. 
in the upcoming Shadow and Bone series. Like, I, I'm not super versed with Shadow and Bone, and it, it's not really something that I'm, I'm super psyched for, but I know when people were like, oh my god, like, here's Ben Barnes reading Shadow and Bone, or, you know, any of the cast making jokes or reading it, it kind of, you you can go, oh, okay, like, so you get it too. Like, you're not just handed this script and been like, oh, fuck it, I'll just do what I want. Um, but there's that level of trust there with them that you can be like, okay, cool, like, you understand. You understand is kind of the best way to put it, for me anyway. <laughs> and we kind of we kind of touched on this before we started recording, but like, and there's nothing that will win over a fan base more than just an amazing performance. I mean, amazing performances. I don't think fans want to admit it, but as soon as they see, oh, this actor is doing a good job, all, almost all the complaints they had before uh, just go to the wayside. <laughs> I mean, I yeah, I think that that was my biggest thing for Never Night for. Uh, I mean, personally, like Mia is such a. Uh, a prominent character in a lot of people's lives and she's you know you see kind of all of the fan art and all of the the, the uh stan twitters and all that sort of stuff and how obsessed they are and how and all that sort of stuff and so there was there was that pressure of it and i think i i didn't notice it until it came out that i was kind of like i think i let my performance slack because i was so busy with everything else and so that's something that i'm taking into the next season is just to focus purely on the acting as opposed to all the other stuff, which is a really random thing to think of, but I feel like it could have been better if I was better. And I'm sure that's just like, that's like an acting thing. And that's just like a, you know, you put something out in the world, you want it to be better. Um, and so I always, I always wonder with actors and stuff, like if they, if they miss the mark or if they get the mark, kind of how that feels being on the other end. Like obviously when, um, I think when, yeah, when Henry Cavill was announced and then when the, the makeup test came out and everyone was like, oh my God, he's a cheap Legolas. Like, ugh. Um, <laughs> kind of you know yeah like I mean people read that like you know I can imagine celebrities still read stuff I still read like I still read all my comments that I get like I'm not just immune to these comments now and so I just find that a really interesting thing like there are still people behind it and just because you don't like it doesn't mean somebody else doesn't like it and I was lucky enough that 99% of our feedback was positive um but there will always be that one who's just like oh she was shit and you're just kind of like oh triggered but also like <laughs> I don't the know what a negative comment will stand out yeah. 10 times more than yeah. all the of positive. Course. Every I feel like time. yeah, every YouTuber, every artist, every any creative, any person really. <laughs> yeah. Well, that one negative and just stew on it forever. So, I'm glad that the positive kind of drowned it out and I wasn't I didn't really have to think about it too much. So, I, I, I want to I want to end with like, not end, but I want to transition to a very oh, corny right. question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, to a corny so question. This is fun. <laughs> this is fun. Bye. No. <laughs> but I'm going to transition to a corny Look question. Sorry. Uh, where, if, you know, you're a fantasy nerd like myself. You have your heart in these in these books in a lot of ways. Um, if you could be a part of any adaptation, uh, any of them, for any series, done before or not, announced to be in the works or not, which one would you like to be a part of? It's aside from continuing Nevernight, I got to take your baby away from you. I'm not gonna let you do the cop out answer. <laughs> no, I mean there's so many that I like. I don't even. I wish I had a prepared answer, but I just there are so many, and there are ones that I know will never happen. But there are ones that I'm like, oh, potentially. But for like Red Rising is my be all and end all. I, there's a character in the in book two that I would just like. She's I would, oh man, I'm I'm emotional thinking about it because I love her so much. But then I think about, realistically, she's a six foot muscular blonde woman. And I'm just like, maybe we're pushing it. But then I'm like, <laughs> you made Gandalf really tall and you made fucking what uh, Elijah Woods really small. Maybe you can make me really big. So <laughs> that's why I'm secretly working out as hard as I possibly can, just in case, because the TV show has is in the works. Um, yeah, Red hey. Rising, Darker Shade of Magic would be a dream come true as well. Um, and this, what else? That's pretty, uh, Red Sister. Red Sister by Mark Lawrence. Nona Gray. Oof, I'm not eight, but man, I would turn back time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I sign up for Holy Sister. Um, I, I maintain yeah. that Red Sister is probably the, the book of the ancestors, probably the best series I read last year. Yeah. Holy crap, it's good. Ah, Love to so see you as one of the nuns. That'd be great. <laughs> Stop it, I would die. Um, what else? Bloody Rose, which is the second book after Kings of the Wild. Um, Rose, I love her. I Have you finished it? Because I know you've read Kings of the, of the Wild recently. Have you read book two? I'm on page like 108. <laughs> Oof, okay. Talk to me when you finish it. Okay. <laughs> Let's have a chat when you finish it. But yeah, those are the kind of ones that really stand out to me, apart from, yeah, Nevernight. Or if Maximum Ride did it again. Yeah. Or Seven Blades 
That'd be Sal. That could be fine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I would. I was actually oh. about to bring up like I literally was looking over here at my Sam Sykes Seven Blades in Black, being like, I mean, Sal would be a pretty badass. <laughs> Thing is, like I, I don't think I do it on purpose, but I think I kind of do it on purpose subconsciously. Like, so Seven Blades in Black is our book club book of the month this year, this week, month. Wow. And I managed to push that on my friends and I guess all of our followers as well. And so I messaged in my group chat the other day with the other host and I was like, what does everyone think of Seven Blades in Black? Because I feel like they'll either really love it or they'll really dislike it. And they were like, so Sal is you. And I just find that <laughs> just a really big compliment when people think my favorite characters remind them of me. And then I'm like, what is up with my ego? So... <laughs> Very much an over-identifier, but that's kind of how I've gotten through all of my fucking shit in life. So I'm not mad about it. Hey, I <laughs> just spent like countless hours when I was a kid just pretending I was in the worlds I was reading. So yeah, yeah, totally I think with I was you. Place where I was like, only call me Max, and I still do. Like when I go to like Boost Juice or I order like a a tea at a, at a, a coffee shop, they're like, what's your name? And I'll just say Max because it's easier than Piera. And for that like brief second in time, I can just live as Max. <laughs> <laughs> If you could, who would you play? I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, I don't think you act, but if you did, or if you could, if they were just like you, sir, you're perfect. Uh, I'd be lying if I wouldn't say, like, I would literally kill someone just to be in the background of the Wheel of Time show. Like, I just so I could wave, like, at the camera. Um, I think that's uh, why you do that. <laughs> but there, I have a, a very deep love for uh, Breath, Book of the Ancestor. I'd love to be one of the guys who's just, like, beat the crap out of by a nun. That'd be a lot of fun. Three men in the book, yeah. Yeah, it's just someone yeah, okay. that gets um yeah. i'm not an actor so i actually really want to limit myself like i would be terrible so i don't want to have lines <laughs> i don't want to be i don't uh, want to ruin it yeah. um and i also like i don't talk about it a ton of my channel but i love how cinematic uh the powder mage trilogy is and how napoleonic it feels and i would love to have like my leg blown off by a cannonball I'm, i could sell pain i could do it's that i could be <laughs> <laughs> I'll scream on the ground and bleed out. It'd be great. Um, I would love for that. Uh, and then pretty much anything Joe Abercrombie has touched, I will, again, just don't don't put me in the foot center because I'll screw it up. I haven't acted since early college, and that was in, like, a senior project. So don't put me in anything big. If I ever get there, if I ever make so much filthy money, I'm going to I'm gonna do it. I'm going to make something, and I'm going to cast you as the lead, and you're going to have to deal with it. Because yeah, you're going to no. want it so badly that you're going to be like, I guess I have to learn how to act now. You gotta give me something that I would be horrible for me to do, though. Just be like, yeah, you're Glacta from First Law, and I'd be like, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, fuck. No, that's, like, no, I'll, I'll put it on my list. It's like a long list of things that I promise people. Because like, oh, when you make it famous, I was like, oh, that's a lot of pressure. But I'll add it to my list. Cast Daniel Green in hardcore fantasy. <laughs> and I also, so have you, have, do you have any interest in science fiction, or are you pretty stringently fantasy? Uh, uh... I, there's a thin line for me. Like, the book that I'm reading at the moment, which is one of my most anticipated books of the year, fucking did the thing where it's like, it's all fantasy, and then it's sci-fi. And I'm like, Dah! and I should have expected it because the author has done it multiple times. Um, it's a really fine line for me. Like, Red Rising is, apart from Nevernight, my favorite series of all time. Mm -hmm. And it's heavily sci-fi, but it's not so heavily sci-fi that it confused me. I think mm -hmm. sci-fi confuses me. I think my brain is too small to comprehend the vastness of space and science. And so therefore I'm just like, uh, just give me a sword and I'll fight a dragon. So it's a, yeah, it's a thin line. <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll push back on that. Some fantasy is definitely as smart as the smartest science fiction. You just, you know, fantasy is about its themes. Well, sci-fi is about its ideas and themes. Um, uh, I feel like I could, I could grasp like a really wacky magic system quicker than I could grasp like the black hole theorem or something stupid like that. So a lot of the time it's just me glazing and being like, ah, oh, yes, science, as opposed to, like, <laughs> it's magic, so plot armor. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by what you're doing here. I'm so excited to see what your channel is going to bring in the future. I'm expecting a full-on Mistborn adaptation just on your channel at the, the rate you're going. Uh, it's stellar to see. I imagine. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, like, I'm really curious because, like, I'm so interested in the mixing of old and new media. And for me, your channel is a very interesting sign in the way things that could go. Because you're not in a big streaming service. You have, a, you have an LLC, I assume, where you have a channel. And you are having a full-on, you're in contact with the author, never night show taking place. So <laughs> pat yourself on the back. That's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I don't know how it happened. And I'm still confused and it doesn't feel real. But thank you. I appreciate it. And I, I mean, a large part of it is people apparently like the shit that comes out of my mouth which blows my mind and my mother wouldn't be proud but 
yeah, just that weird. I, I don't know if you go through it as well. Like you, you're at home alone, sitting in front of your computer, potentially with no pants on, making a video <laughs> about, about shit you love, and someone in the world somewhere is like, you know what, I fuck with that. And that's just a really weird, powerful thing, and that I wouldn't have been able to make an Evernight without a lot of those people being like, yeah, cool, she's not, she's not all right, she's not too bad. So, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, yeah, it's it's incredible. The <laughs> community, I, yeah. the community around these books is like, I'm I'm gonna sound so corny, but it's freaking magical. Like, it's, it's so cool, cool to see so many people who are so passionate and so interested. Like, having a five hour conversation with a stranger online about the implications of a certain thing in a magic system, and like you get down a rabbit hole to a point where you're like, well, how would it work in space with no gravity? And it's like. Ooh, There's a reason that, no one talked to us in high school. That's, that's, that's the shit that makes me happy. So, yeah. No, I, I completely agree. It's it's this weird, yeah, this weird little pocket of the universe that when you step outside to real world and you're like, oh, have you heard about the drama with, you know, XYZ book and author? And people are like, no. Like, what? <laughs> it's like, yeah. And then you've got, like, oh, my God, I've got all this knowledge. What do I do with it? To the internet. So it's really, it's nice to find other weirdos who are as weird as you. I, I think the most infuriating thing I've heard from, like, the outside our bubble thing was I was talking with someone who was a big Game of Thrones fan, and I was like, oh, you should check out this other fantasy shows. And they go, I don't really like fantasy. And I was like, you just said Game of Thrones is your favorite show. And they're like, well, Game of Thrones is not fantasy. And I was like, well, we're going to get in a fist fight now. <laughs> <laughs> like, I can, like, I can see it, but also I'm confused by it. And then you're just kind of like, oh, yeah, so when, when the dragons, I'm like, what dragons? The fantasy dragons. <laughs> it has the most fantastical creature in the history of fantasy. Nah, it's, I just think it's Yeah, exactly. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on. It's been a blast. Anytime. All right. I'm going to stop the recording now.